Um, today we have the pleasure of listening to Yuqing Lu uh, from Tsinghua University, and he's going to be telling us about magnetized massive to supermassive stars. Uh, over to you, Yuqing. Good afternoon, uh, friends and colleagues. Okay, uh, the title of my talk is a magnetized massive to supermassive stars. So when I say massive, could be say hundred solar masses, and supermassive stars could be millions or ten millions. Uh, solar masses of X um, range. This is a broad range. And I emphasize it's uh, magnetized. That means it involves magnetic field. Uh, typically, when people talk about a star, we have gas pressure, or if you're very massive, you also have a radiation pressure. And in this case, we want to include magnetic field. So you would also have magnetic force participating uh, the balance of the star. So that's a key uh, elements of this talk, okay? And you can see the background of this uh, picture. That's actually uh, Cape Town I took in 2015, okay? And a very nice and uh, beautiful place. Okay, uh, my name is Yu Qing Lo from Tsinghua University Physics Department. And that's our symbolic building. And here is a grant acknowledgement uh, to the grant support for many years for this work. This is also Tsinghua University uh, with uh, cherry blossoming. Okay, and this talk generally involved uh, general relativity and uh, compact objects, okay? So I will give you a brief introduction, a uh, quick one, and you probably all know this book uh, by Shapiro and Tukoski. Uh, it's on the compact objects. So I'll give you first quick thing for the white dwarfs. This is our sun. I particularly choose one with sunspot. Uh, sunspot involves magnetic field, uh, typically 3,000 to 4,000 Gausses, okay? In solar magnetic activity, that's well known. And then if you try to calculate the Schwarzschild black hole, a spherically symmetric one with the uh, Schwarzschild radius, that's two gm over c squared. G is the gravitational constant, m is the mass of the star, uh, and c is the speed of light in vacuum. If you choose a one solar mass stuff, and this Schwarzschild radius will give you three, roughly three kilometer. And this is a image of a planetary nebula, but there are a whole variety of them. And this is just say, uh, we expect our sun uh, eventually will turn into a planetary nebula and will become a white dwarf at the very center. The theory of the white dwarf, uh, you prob probably heard of uh, the maximum mass limit, that's 1.4 solar masses, uh, was developed by uh, Chandrasekhar. And somehow, uh, at that time, he was a student, and his idea was uh, strongly opposed by Sir Arthur Eddington, a powerful figure in England at that time, a great astrophysicist. That, uh, this is Eddington. And uh, eventually, Chandra has to move to, had to move to the United States to Yerkes Observatory and then to University of Chicago. Uh, and then he wrote a book in memory of Eddington. The title of the book is Eddington, the most distinguished astrophysicist of his time. This is a book, I, you probably read about it or maybe in the classroom, uh, written by Chandrasekhar on stellar structure. Now, this is a image of a, a series B a little white dwarf there, and then you can see this is a taken by a Hubble Space Telescope. This is a Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, this is Chandrasekhar. And if the essence of that theory, uh, this figure, the horizontal uh, axis is uh, the sort of the radius, and the vertical axis is the density. It's uh, made the dimensionless. And on the very, very uh, inward, this uh, curve, that's to the limit of the so-called Chandrasekhar mass limit. You see the density distribution. And to the right is gamma to the 5 thirds. So basically Chandra go, uh, let the degenerate, the electron goes to the relativistic limit. And then you have the uh, power index of gamma equal to 4 thirds. Uh, this is uh, the same thing, but basically the M3 is sort of the Chandrasekhar mass limit and horizontal axis of the mass. The vertical axis is the radius of the star, uh, the white dwarf. You can see from this simple theory, basically, if you have a smaller mass, 
your radius is larger. This is symbolic larger size. And then if you go to the mass limit, you eventually go to radius to zero. Okay, that's a theory in the idealized sense. But uh, if you follow this uh, concept, you, immediate, you immediately realize if you go to smaller, smaller radius, for example, to the extreme, if you go to the three kilometers, then this whole thing should go to the black hole or uh, you have to start to use a uh, general relativity, okay? Chandra theory at that time uh, only invoked the special relativity when you go to the speed of light limit for the electrons, okay? So basically you realize even for white dwarf theory, if you go, to, go towards the uh, mass limit, you have to take care of the general relativistic effects, okay? In fact, in 1949, there was a paper by Kaplan. Actually, he discussed this. So in short, basically, if you are increase the mass, eventually when the radius goes sort of a 1,000 kilometer or so, you have to take care of the uh, general GR effect, okay? And then there's an instability would occur. So I just want to uh, make it clear, even for the wide world theory, if you want or worry about the stability of the, uh, the stellar object, you have to take, a, uh, take care of the GR effects. So this was a paper by Kaplan and uh, Lupanov that's uh, in 1965. But basically you can follow, this is a sort of a classical analysis of the stability of a relativistic instability for polytropic spheres. Another aspect, this is uh, young T.D. Lee. He got Nobel Prize, shared Nobel Prize with C.N. Young in 1957. Uh, that was made up uh, their uh, sort of analysis for the parity uh, violence, uh, violation uh, for weak interaction, okay? But actually he started uh, his PhD thesis with Enrico Fermi at University of Chicago. And uh, the thesis, paper is hydrogen content and energy productive mechanism of white dwarfs, okay? So that's published in the Astrophysical Journal uh, in 1950. That's PhD, his PhD work. So in essence, if you read this uh, expression here, uh, the Chandrasekhar uh, expression, because the 5.75, that's involved the physical parameters, okay? Uh, the co physical constants. And eta, that's the number of electron per nuclear, okay? So if you have a major thing is like proton and electron in the white dwarf, this eta would be one. But if you have a helium, a helium core, uh, like you have four nucleons and two electrons, then this eta would be a half, okay? So in short, uh, T.D. Lee in his uh, PhD thesis basically argued this eta, um, the hydrogen content in the white dwarf must be very small, less than 1% by mass, okay? So basically you have to have dominantly helium core and electrons. So then this eta should be a half, and then you reduce this mass to the 1.44 solar masses, okay? So you can see at the end of his uh, thesis, he uh, acknowledged Enrico Fermi, uh, Chandrasekhar, and also uh, Kuiper, okay? the same uh, Kuiper Belt object person. So this is a copy of the book. Now we go to the neutron star. The reason I talk about the neutron star because neutron star uh, first conceived purely theoret theoretically, okay? But eventually you have to include magnetic field uh, with the di di diagnostic features, then you can discover it, that's in short, okay? So this is a famous uh, picture of Crab Nebula. And here's the Chinese historical record of 1054 in Song Dynasty uh, for this uh, remarkable event. And now we know at the very center here somewhere, you have a radio pulsar, okay? Uh, making uh, sort of a 30 turns per second, okay? So this is a false color, uh, an X-ray image. It's a sort of around the center here, that's the, the pulsar. And this is an X-ray image uh, around the center of this image, okay? And I mentioned here a few things. Here is a Frédéric uh, Joliot-Curie, 
and Irene Curie, okay, uh, daughter of Madame Curie. Uh, basically, they sort of, uh, from their experimental work, they missed somehow a neutron. They missed the discovery of a positron, okay? And uh, eventually, he got uh, they um, got Nobel Prize for their ra radioactive uh, activity work. Okay, but basically, he said uh, should be pay attention to theory. Otherwise, he could make more major discoveries for neutron and uh, positron. And this is Chadwick. Uh, in 1932, he discovered uh, neutron. Okay, and it, this is uh, Landau. Uh, basically, you probably heard of the story. He, when he learned of the news of the discovery of a uh, neutron, he quickly made up an estimate for the neutron star that what we call, and basically uh, estimated the mass and the uh, radius like a uh, 10 kilometer of the size. Okay, so that's very impressive. But at this moment, this is purely theoretical. Okay, and this is Einstein. We all know uh, published his uh, general relativity in 1915, okay? This is a Einstein field equation. On the left-hand side, that's a curvature. On the right, that's an energy moment, momentum tensor, a stress tensor. G is a gravitational constant. C is the speed of light. Uh, in 1939, uh, Oppenheimer and his students uh, develop a, a Oppenheimer-Volkov equation. Basically, they apply the GR uh, to the neutron star problem, and they develop the equi equilibrium problem and also make the stability analysis. And sometimes this is called uh, another professor at Caltech, a Toman. So sometimes it's call, called QOV equations. Okay. So I just give you a quick thing. This is the, their paper, uh, Oppenheimer Volkov, 1939, uh, massive neutron cores. Okay. So this is uh, their basic equation. There are more stuff here. But I just want you to pay attention to this part. Oh, sorry. To this part, uh, basically, this is the uh, energy density, four pi r squared. So this u would be, would be the equi equivalent mass enclosed within radius r, and this is sort of a general relativistic version of the radial force balance. But you have to involve this thing out here. Oh, apparently they said c equal to one or somewhere. So that would be sort of a Schwarzschild radius part, okay? So you can also see the references to Doman on the same volume, okay? So basically they provide the theoretical uh, basis. Of, uh, of course, they assume a polytropic sphere. Uh, nowadays, we all know, we do not know exactly the equation of state for a neutron star. There are many models, but once you know that, uh, based on this uh, TOV equation, you can uh, compute the neutron star or even talk about the mass limit. This is Bard and this is Zwicky. They published paper on uh, regarding neutron star in 1934. Okay, and basically they argued a uh, neutron star could form uh, during this supernova explosion. They also talk about the acceleration of uh, high energy particles of cosmic rays, etc. Okay. Very impressive paper for physical arguments. This is uh, uh, Franco Pacini, and uh, around 1967, he went. Uh, he visited Cornell University and tried to think of the uh, neutron star with magnetic field. Okay. And this is Thomas Gold, and uh, he sort of uh, made his name uh, basically uh, arguing for the. Say if you have a neutron star, you have a magnetic dipole, and the dipole axis and the rotation axis of neutron star are uh, misaligned. Then you can radiate uh, with electromagnetic energy at the rotation energy of the neutron star. Okay, so in a sense, when you have a electromagnetic pulse uh, giving out, then you will rotate a little bit slower. Okay, tiny, tiny. Okay, but that effect is observable. This is uh, Tony Hewish. Jocelyn Bell, they made it their first discovery in 1967 uh, for the first uh, radio pulsar, okay? But if you really uh, closely follow the theory, uh, uh, understanding at, at that time, people did not accept neutron star at the very beginning. They argued about the white dwarf and magnetic field, etc. 
although in their origi original paper, they briefly mentioned the possibility of neutron star, okay? But that's due to uh, Thomas Go. As I said earlier, because once you have a pulse uh, electromagnetic wave e emission, you rotate slower. So if you monitor a radio pulsar, you can see this effect, okay? So I will repeat my intention of talking about this series because if we talk about neutron star, you could in at the very simp simplest level, you don't have to worry about magnetic field, okay? But you don't know how to discover it, how to detect it. But once you know the magnetic field, you know the rotation, and then uh, that gives you a way of an important way of discovery, the radio pulsar. Okay, here I just give a quick stuff, uh, basically from the TOV equation. Uh, if you knew the uh, equation of state, uh, you can do the calculation. Here's the result, of, uh, the horizontal axis is the radius of a star. The vertical axis, axis is the mass in solar masses, okay? So if you follow here, the larger size, sort of a, a 10,000 kilometer, and then you can have a branch of the stable white dwarf. On this side is unstable. And once you go a uh, smaller, smaller radii and the higher density, uh, you will see you can have another branch here and that will be the stable, this branch on this side, it would be stable neutron stars. And the differences here could be the uh, equation of state of different things, okay? So give you, uh, but here also I just keep in mind, in this model, uh, you, you are relatively simple. You ha only have a central density, for example, as the uh, one parameter, and then you can uh, do the calculation from the center, uh, solving the uh, TOV equation, uh, reaching the uh, uh, outer radius, okay? So you only involve one parameter. So here I sub, uh, sort of uh, summarize the neutron star. Eventually you need rotation, uh, magnetic field, a dipole field, uh, electromagnetic radiation, okay? That's the part we need to, for discovery of neutron stars, okay? And then of course, if you try to follow uh, their origin, you have the stellar explosion as Barr and Zwicky argued for supernovae. And also uh, during that process, you can have the acceleration of cosmic rays. You can produce gamma rays. Uh, you can even produce, if you are sort of a in, uh, not spherically symmetric, you can also produce uh, gravitational waves. Okay, there are other things. So this is a picture of Arecibo, uh, the 300 meter one. Uh, it stopped operation uh, several, uh, a few years ago, okay? But historically, he also made, uh, this is by House and Taylor. They discovered a binary uh, pulsar, uh, two neutron stars, one is a radio pulsar. And then basically they follow the variation of the timing data. They can infer uh, the gravitational wave emission, okay? And they shared the Nobel Prize of uh, 1993. So this is an image you may encounter at several different places. Uh, these are two sort of, you can think of either black hole or neutron star or any compact objects. And then when they rotate around each other, uh, very figuratively, they will emit gravitational waves, okay? So uh, for House and Taylor, that's two neutron stars. And later when we talk about LIGO and Virgo, that's two black holes. Okay, this is, is an image of the FAST, a uh, 500 meter radio telescope, a uh, spherical radio telescope uh, in China, in Guizhou. Uh, this is sort of a 500 meter. But if you want to do the real observation, the effective uh, aperture is sort of a 300 meter, okay? This take, big picture was taken around uh, 2016, just uh, sort of when the project completed, okay? Before the, uh, the, the checking and testing. And before the construction, that was a cost uh, configuration uh, there are, you can see the village here. Basically, you have to clean up this whole area, eventually build up this 500 radio telescope. And by now, I think there are several, several hundred uh, radio pulsars uh, were discovered by FAST. Okay, let's talk uh, briefly about the black hole. Uh, we also have that in mind. And the Schwarzschild radius we indicated, uh, sort of a 2GM over C squared, okay? And then you probably also heard of a curl black hole, uh, a rotating black hole. 
And also uh, in 2020, Nobel Prize given to black hole, okay, to Roger Penrose, uh, Gentel, and uh, 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 Andrea Gates, okay. So this is uh, Albert Einstein. This is Carl Schwarzschild. So the th GR theory, uh, 1915, and the uh, discovery of the black hole solution by Schwarzschild in 1916 published. And the curl discovery of the new solution of a rotating black hole, uh, that's in 1963, okay? And then black hole coined by Bob Dickey, popularized by John Wheeler in 1967. So that's a brief, uh, quick thing. Okay, uh, so you probably encountered this in textbook somewhere, uh, the sort of a uh, spherically symmetric uh, metric, okay? And this is Kerr when he visited China. Uh, this is in Kunnan, uh, in Kunming, Yunnan uh, province. Um, you probably heard of the Event Horizon Telescope observed uh, the M87, so that the in the millimeter wave bands, and then here's the sort of a uh, the black hole periphery, the event horizon. This is uh, John, James Badin, the son of famous John Badin. Okay, uh, G, uh, James Badin is a, a relativistic uh, theorist, and uh, at the early time he made a lot of contribution to the whatever event horizon telescope people use. But at that time, he was he didn't really think uh, there's a time we can really observe the shape of the black hole. So this is the atmospheric uh, absorption. There are optical region, there are radio stuff, there are millimeter bands. So this is the uh, VLBI, very long baseline interferometry, but for millimeter bands. And eventually for SKA, South uh, Square Kilometer Array, that's also a kind of a longer wavelength uh, uh, interferometer, okay? So this is for the uh, sort of a network for observing event horizon telescope in the millimeter bands for observing M87, okay? This is a updated image of M87. So this is a curl. I met him uh, again in, uh, in, in, uh, in Italy to celebrate his solution for 50 years. That's 2013. Uh, this is uh, Xing Tong Yao. He made a lot of, um, uh, he's a mathematician, also a physics professor at Harvard University now. And he made a lot of contribution to general relativity. And he received the uh, Marcel Grossman Awards in 2018. Uh, the Nobel Prize for 2020 uh, given to Roger Penrose, Reinhard Gensel and Andrea Gates. Uh, the latter two for the observation and Roger Penrose to show uh, the symmetry, whatever is not uh, that crucial, uh, eventually the singularity would form uh, in general relativity, okay? And uh, Gensel and Gates, uh, they sort of independently uh, using large telescopes, one in uh, Chile and the other one in, uh, uh, in, the United, in Hawaii, okay? So this is Roger Penrose. Uh, Reinhard Gensel, that's uh, the eight, four eighty uh, eight meter uh, telescope in Chile. Andrea Gates, this is Keck, a two ten meter uh, optical telescope. Okay, and that's their observation of a S two, or they use different names for two teams, S zero two, and basically orbiting around the uh, center of our galaxy, Sagittarius A, and that has a four hundred uh, sort of a four hundred mi uh, million. Four million, sorry, four million solar masses. Uh, it's a smaller one uh, in the category of the supermassive black hole. Okay, now we turn to LIGO Virgo uh, reports of gravitational waves, and starting from nine, uh, 2015. Okay, and uh, that's the uh, Rainer Weiss, uh, Barry Barish, and uh, Keith Thorne. Okay, so. Basically, they have a sort of a Michelson uh, interferometer of four kilometer, and then you can see that once you have a gravitational wave coming in, uh, they have a relative change, then the, uh, inter uh, the interferometer uh, fringes would change. They record the message, but that's a very, very weak effect. Here, very figuratively, two sort of a, a binary uh, compact objects, black holes, or you could also have a sort of a neutron star. 
Okay, that's the same image. And this is when they sort of a, a by uh, moving around each other, eventually merge to form one single one. Here is the gravitational wave. And uh, they sort of a, a signal one from, uh, from the uh, Livingston in Louisiana and the other one in Hanford, uh, Washington, northwest uh, part of the United States. So they have already discovered or reported uh, sort of a more than 50 binary uh, black hole system uh, by detecting the gravita gravitational wave signals, okay? So here uh, is, uh, okay, but then comes to a problem I will also discuss later uh, uh, in more detail. Basically, uh, people didn't really think about black holes, okay, uh, of this like uh, several tens of solar masses before, but purely because the LIGO Virgo detection, people turn their attention to this system. Uh, and then people thought if you have a very massive star and when you have the supernova explosion, then if you're if, if, if you're not too massive, and then you can form like uh, 20, 30, or uh, 40 solar masses black holes, okay? Uh, but if you really follow this uh, sort of chain of reasoning, uh, eventually you need a very massive uh, stars to form a more massive black holes. But then once you have a more massive star, uh, the temperature of the, uh, the central temperature becomes higher. Uh, when you reach 10 to the nine or 10 to the 10 Kelvin, then you will encounter a so-called pair instability. In a sense, it's a photon, gamma ray photon, um, uh, one MeV or so, uh, basically you can split into a electron and a positron. And then this, because a uh, positron is the antimatter of electron, we call this uh, electron positron pair production, okay? And because when you, the st stellar central temperature becomes very high, you can have this pair production, and then you will change the equation of state and then induce instability. So that's, people have a particular terminology, the pair instability supernova, okay? So once you have the pulsation of the supernova, and then when they explode, you can destroy the center uh, uh, compact object completely, okay? That's why people talk about the so-called forbidden uh, mass zone for black holes or mass gap for black holes. Uh, roughly, according to the numerical simulation, is between like 65 solar masses to maybe 120 solar masses in that range, okay? But uh, LIGO-Virgo uh, detected several uh, binary uh, system uh, in which at least one component is already in this uh, forbidden zone, mass zone, okay? And uh, last year they reported a sort of a, the two, uh, the binary components, both of them are sort of fall in this mass of uh, forbidden mass known for black hole. So the problem is if you say, uh, since you can merge smaller black hole to form a larger one, then in principle or conceptually, you can also form smaller one uh, to form uh, black holes into this uh, uh, mass gap, okay? So, but but this chance is uh, very small. Basically, you need four pairs of black holes eventually to form this particular events, okay? So this is a particular event. You have two black holes in the forbidden zone, and then they merge to form a larger black hole, okay? So I talk about this, I'll come back when we uh, follow the theory, okay? So uh, I already talked about this uh, black hole mass gap or the forbidden zone for black hole masses. And uh, I also mentioned the electron positron pair instability. Okay, there are also historical things uh, for the physical experiment. Okay. Anyway, oh, I would like to give a uh, interesting story, uh, anecdotes. Uh, basically, uh, this is uh, Professor Thoris Hans Hansen he is the Nobel Prize, a member of the Nobel Prize Committee. And then uh, in 2017, he visited China and gave a lecture on the gravita gravita gravitational wave stuff, okay? And uh, not too many people attended that lecture and I had uh, time to discuss with him. And said, since you 
uh, gave a Nobel Prize to the gravitational wave for uh, LIGO people, okay? And I said, because for that physical interpretation, uh, they said that's a binary uh, black holes, okay? So that implicitly you, you need to recognize the, the very fact of the black hole that exists in nature, okay? And also black hole is also a unique prediction of general relativity. So uh, that's my simple reasoning and uh, argument, okay? Of course, as a Nobel Prize committee member, he cannot promise anything, but uh, somehow, uh, three years later, uh, Nobel Prize uh, is give, uh, was given to uh, the black hole. So I made a little bit contribution to that. Well, <laughs> okay. So, oh, this gentleman actually, he's sort of a, a Swedish guy. He got Nobel Prize in the sort of a medical part, but he also involved in the committee uh, service for many years. He's sort of a, against the relativity to receive the Nobel Prize. So that's a very interesting story, okay? Now we come back to the supermassive stars, quasars, and uh, supermassive black holes. So uh, Martin Schmidt, he made an important uh, discovery, now we call it quasar, in 1963. Basically, he noticed uh, some stellar kind of object with uh, unrecognizable uh, spectrum. Only after a while, he figured out that because uh, the spectrum uh, shifted uh, red or, uh, redward, okay? So basically when you shift it back, you recognize as hydrogen uh, spectrum, okay? So that's his short paper published in, uh, in Nature in 1963. Uh, that's indicated here, okay? So that's the uh, current, uh, we know uh, QSO, that's quasi-stellar optics. Or well, now we recognize that uh, active galactic nuclei and sometimes it all involves the radio jets at the lower left corner, okay? And this is a fairly recent uh, sort of a quasar image. This is a high redshift as Z equal to 6.3. Uh, you can see the dots in some bands, you can see the emission, but other bands you cannot, okay? So that's a give you a more vivid impression of a quasar. And this is Fred Hoyle, a very influential theoretical astrophysicist at England. And this is uh, Fowler. He got Nobel Prize in 1983 uh, together with Chandrasekhar, okay, Willie Fowler. So together in 1963, they published a paper on the so-called supermassive stars, okay, uh, without magnetic field. Uh, basically, <clears throat> they were motivated by the observation of a quasar, now we know, uh, also radio stars, okay. Uh, although, uh, Right now, the supermassive star remain hypothetical. Uh, we, but the theoretical sort of a uh, model started from there, uh, uh, 1963, okay? Uh, and then later on, uh, supermassive black holes, sort of from uh, millions to billions of solar masses, sort of become the leading model to explain the so-called quasars, okay? Uh, credit due to Zeldovich, uh, Sao Peter, okay? So uh, basically we, we argued for the, uh, we explained for compact objects for wide off neutron star and black holes, we need the general relativity. Now, when we talk about the massive to supermassive stars, why do we need the general relativity, okay? So here uh, for supermassive star, you have uh, gas pressure, radiation pressure. And then when you sort of a, uh, become very massive, uh, you need to use a uh, general relativity, okay? Although they are not, in a sense, not a compact object, okay? In particular, if you try to understand the stability, the radio pulsation stability of these supermassive stars, uh, you need a general relativity because if you use a Newtonian theory, uh, then basically the stability is uh, your power index must be greater than four thirds, the gamma must be greater than four thirds. But if you invoke GR, then uh, your power index must be greater than, must be greater than four thirds, adding something, okay? Not just big, uh, uh, Newtonian theory, the critical condition is, is right at the gamma equal to three, four thirds. But if you are involving general relativity in, in general, you have to be, um, leave certain margin uh, greater than the four thirds, okay? 
So I generally regard if you include the magnetic field, uh, basically now we can uh, analyze that as a model parameter, uh, could be large and small, and then indicating magnetic field weak and strong, okay? And a larger uh, tau parameter would be stronger magnetic field, weaker would be weaker, okay? So uh, uh, understandably, if you have a weaker, very weak, then it's very close to a normal or whatever without magnetic field. But once you get a stronger magnetic field, uh, they become a sort of a normal type of astro uh, physical object, okay? Uh, for example, uh, if you have a fairly strong magnetic field, basically you can have a very massive object because of, because of the magnetic support, you can have a very massive object, but the central temperature do not need to be very high. Density may not be very high. So our conventional wisdom without magnetic field uh, would be uh, if you are very massive, you will be uh, more nuclear react uh, fusion at the center. Uh, the temperature is higher, much more luminous, evolve faster and lifetime shorter for a star, okay? But in principle, if your magnetic is strong enough, you could have something not that luminous, okay, for that mass, okay? And then that can stay there for a fairly long time, okay? So let me give you a quick thing for the supermassive star without magnetic field at this point. And I choose a paper by uh, Robert Tooper uh, in 1965, okay? He was a PhD student of uh, Chandrasekhar at the University of Chicago. So you can see th this is referred to as a standard model for massive, uh, he used the word massive, but eventually, uh, basically once you involve the radiation pressure, okay? So as I said, the key elements for this equi equilibrium, that's the gas pressure plus the radiation pressure, okay? Then you have to make an assumption regarding the relation of the two. So if we regard the total pressure as a summation of the gas pressure plus the radiation pressure, then there's a parameter we introduce is the beta parameter as the ratio of the gas pressure over the total pressure, okay? And this pressure, uh, parameter was introduced by uh, Arthur Eddington in his 1918 paper, okay? So that's, I talk about the uh, beta parameter. It's a dim dimensionless one. It's the gas pressure to the total pressure, okay? Uh, that's the Eddington. And they also refer to the uh, sort of an original paper by Hoyle and Fowler in 1963, okay? Okay, so here I give you some notation. Uh, here PG is a gas pressure, PR is a radiation pressure. Uh, capital P is the total pressure. And PG follow the ideal gas law, uh, temperature, uh, gas mass density, Boltzmann constant, mean molecular weight, uh, proton mass, okay? And uh, radiation pressure, that's the black body radiation, the radiation constant A involving physical constants, T is the temperature, okay? So if you consider the energy density, uh, you have the rest mass of the gas density, uh, C squared, okay? And then you have, uh, if you have the gas pressure, the internal energy, and then you also have the uh, three times the radiation pressure as the radiation energy density. So this is the energy density of the system for uh, without rotation, spherically symmetric, okay? So you can set up certain, this is the PG uh, related to the beta, the total pressure, okay? Beta is the constant assumed, okay? And then you can find the radiation pressure and the temperature, how to relate to the total pressure, the uh, T four square, whatever. And then you can figure out without any approximation, here is in the coefficient, okay? Involving the radiation constant, involving the beta, uh, that's the, total pressure related to the rho g, and that's uh, up to the power of four third, okay? So here is the total pressure. This is the energy density. You can also cast this thing related to the gas density, okay? So in a sense, uh, you can find an equation of state relating, uh, this is the total pressure, this is rho g, and the energy density he here involves, all involves rho g, uh, as well as other parameters, okay? So then you have an equation of state here. Uh, remember, we have a assumption here of, uh, of constant beta, and that beta parameter is one important parameter in this uh, model problem, okay? 
So that's the Schwarzschild spiral asymmetric one uh, metric, okay? And then here the, uh, from the uh, Oppenheimer Volkov, okay, from general relativity for the radio uh, hydrostatic equilibrium, okay? So that's the equivalent mass within radius R, total pressure, gravitational constant. And here, make sure this is the energy density over C squared. So it's give you the equivalent mass. So this is a sort of a GR concept of the uh, equation of equilibrium, okay? Uh, so sort of a uh, TOV equation for a massive star or stars involving radiation and gas pressure, okay? And uh, once you know the boundary conditions, uh, you already know the equation of state in this form, okay? Basically, you can regard rho g or as the sort of a parameter. Once you know, you know the energy density and the total pressure relation, okay? So then you can solve uh, this problem by specify the boundary condition at the center and uh, at the outer boundary uh, where you define the radius of a star, okay? Uh, so here is some uh, mathematical derivation. I'll go quickly, but just give you impression and feeling, uh, make the equations dimensionless, uh, change of variables, okay? And all sort of a mathematical operation, no further approximation. And then here is the uh, boundary condition in the center uh, at the outer boundary, okay? And then you can derive, uh, th this is a dimensionless function. You can derive all the physical quantities uh, like mass, Okay, and the radius, etc. cetera. So uh, you can also uh, see the central temperature. Here, I think they also introduce another important parameter. Let me try to find it. Uh, where is it? Alpha here, I, I try to find the definition of alpha. Uh, alpha, alpha here, let's see. Mm, here is the alpha, okay? So I uh, mentioned the beta parameter. Here's the alpha parameter. Is the, uh, at the stellar center, the total pressure over the stellar center, the gas density, okay, central density, C squared. So it's also dimensionless. Uh, it's, uh, it, you can call it a relativity parameter. Basically, when alpha becomes large, the relativistic effect would be stronger. And uh, when it's uh, small, uh, it gradually goes to the Newtonian limit, okay? So give you the, this is the central total pressure over the uh, mass density equivalent to energy, the rest mass energy density, okay? Okay, so alpha, beta, you remember these uh, two parameters. I'll go quicker, skip all these. You can define, like you can find the relation between the uh, central temperature and the alpha, para, uh, alpha beta, mean molecular weight, proton mass, Boltzmann constant, C squared, et cetera, okay? So that's a relation for, uh, among them. So uh, as I mentioned, if you talk about the uh, pair instability, the central temperature would like involving 10 to the nine Kelvin or 10 to the 10 Kelvin, okay? So started you uh, have the pair instability. I'll go quicker, okay. So here is a plot. Uh, this is the alpha parameter. That's the beta parameter in logarithmic scale. And here, because of the relation we know that the temperature for different temperatures, you can see the alpha beta range. So if you go beyond this range, uh, you need to take care of the pair instability. We, at this moment, we don't worry about it, okay? So here are the sort of a density. You have the uh, gas density, total uh, equil equivalent mass density, uh, this is the radiation one. This is the kinetic energy one, okay? So you have the spe uh, speed of sound, uh, the gamma P over rho, uh, square root of that. Uh, you can calculate the different energies, okay? Okay, uh, you have the kinetic uh, gas energy and the, uh, the radiation energy, okay? Now, the most important thing here, we realize uh, that's uh, in Tupper's analysis, is the so-called binding energy. That means when your system is uh, far apart, uh, you can calculate the energy. And then we are when they form a, uh, a stellar object, they have another energy. The difference between the two defines the uh, binding energy, okay? I'll go quick. Uh, 
Okay, here comes, uh, it's a fairly mathematical, but give you the uh, physical idea. So it's uh, straightforward to compute the uh, uh, stellar equi equilibrium, okay? Uh, given the parameters alpha and beta. And now we also need to know the stability property or the instability property of the system, okay? So uh, basically you can perturb, uh, perturb the system, consider a radial pulsation uh, analysis. And in the you linearize the equation, uh, you, can, you can have the perturbation uh, also all using uh, GR, okay? And then you can apply the so-called variation of principle. And then for the perturbation part, you can write uh, e, uh, the variable as e to the i omega t. Let me find it somewhere. Uh, let's see. No, I maybe I jumped. Anyway, you write the perturbation as a function times e to the i omega t, okay? Uh, basically, omega you consider as a frequency. But once you form the variational principle, you realize the system evolving a, a omega squared, okay? And all the other is sort of an integral, uh, evolving some unknown solution evolved. So the basic idea is, is you have the freedom to choose a, a function. If, if you have any arbitrary chosen function, omega squared is always positive, then the system would be stable, okay? But if you choose uh, a particular function uh, satisfying the boundary condition, uh, but that makes the omega squared less than zero, then the system becomes unstable. So basically people use this way uh, is one way to determine the stability pr problem uh, of the system. So if you want to uh, follow the variational principle, you can uh, read the paper by Chandrasekhar 1964, okay? And then for the perturbation part, you have a uh, total pressure and the uh, uh, gas uh, density and then you have a sort of a, a adiabatic uh, coefficient uh, capital gamma one, okay? And this gamma one, uh, if you derive it, if you follow the, uh, that part uh, in the derivation in Chandrasekhar book in 1939, then you figure out this gamma one uh, sort of uh, related to the beta parameter and also related to the gamma parameter, okay? So uh, that's uh, for, from the GR analysis. Uh, basically for supermassive star, okay? And then you have the, the peak uh, here on this side that's stable, fo follow the GR analysis on this part is unstable, okay? Okay, magnetized part, I just give you the formulation. So basically, uh, okay, uh, si fairly similar to the earlier uh, for the supermassive star without magnetic field, uh, the uh, symbol are the same. But basically, I need to also hear the same, okay? Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, the beta here, the alpha parameter here, the same definition. Uh, you can see these things, whatever that's a mathematical. Here is a crucial assumption for the magnetic field. Because for the radial equ equilibrium, you need to specify uh, magnetic uh, pressure or magnetic energy density, okay? Here we assume a transverse mag magnetic field, random, like a ball, okay? And then uh, basically we presume they have a relation for the proportional to rho g squared r squared. And this relation is valid for a dynamic analysis. And we assume it also works for the static configuration, okay? So with this one, you can derive a a magnetized version of the Oppenheim uh, TOV equation. Here, this is a total pressure. This is the magnetic pressure. This is a total pressure, magnetic pressure. This is the energy density. This is the magnetic energy density. Uh, this is a magnetic tension force, okay? And then this is a d nu dr related to the uh, metric d nu dr. And that's a P magnetic pressure and uh, enclosed mass. And once you have the, without magnetic, that's the epsilon, and then involving magnetic field, you have to consider the magnetic energy density, okay? So this set is the uh, magnetized version. So from this one, uh, we can also uh, find a stellar object, magnetized one, depending uh, you uh, sort of put in the magnetic field strength, uh, weaker or stronger, okay? So in short, uh, when you put stronger magnetic field, 
you would have a, I will try to find a figure. Oh, we also have the perturbation analysis in, in, uh, in parallel, okay, involving magnetic field, uh, binding energy stuff. This is the energy integral stuff. This is a virial theorem. Uh, let's see, oh, okay, here's the figure. Uh, basically, uh, the tau parameter is the dimensionless one characterized the magnetic field, okay? So this M is the total magnetic energy, this omega absolute value, that's the gravitational potential. So this tau would uh, give you the ratio of this thing, okay? And you can never have this ratio greater than one. You must uh, have a static equilibrium for uh, magnetic pressure, uh, magnetic energy less than gravitational potential energy, okay? And this is a radius. Th this is the uh, density, okay? So this is the alpha parameter, beta parameter, tau related to the magnetic field. So without magnetic field zero, uh, gradually increasing, okay? So you can see when tau near, near one, you have a very extended uh, uh, stellar configuration. So this is for a different set of alpha and uh, alpha is the same, but beta is different, okay? And then uh, you also for different uh, magnetic field. So you can see that's the extended one, okay? Uh, so if I, uh, since time is short, I just give you a quick uh, thing, uh, what I, uh, I'm driving for, okay? Basically I said, once you have a sufficiently strong magnetic field in a massive star, okay? Either several tens solar masses or hundred solar masses, okay? If your magnetic field is stronger enough, uh, not in a very crazy way, okay? Then you can have a large mass and then you have central temperature not very high. Okay, in essence, when this happens, you can avoid the so-called pair instability. So when this star collapses, it will form black holes. Okay, uh, of course they squeeze uh, materials and magnetic field all together into the central uh, black hole. Okay, so in a sense, you can have a kind of a direct collapse and then you form uh, the black holes in the so-called uh, forbidden zone, okay? So in a sense, this would avoid uh, the problem when people with, uh, without considering the magnetic field, okay? So if we sort of, of course, we need an independent way to search for the uh, strongly magnetized uh, stars, okay? One important way would be uh, when you have, when you observe a star, uh, you can observe the luminosity. If you know the distance, uh, you can observe the spectrum. And then normally people would use the model without magnetic field to infer its mass, okay? Uh, but if for some system, if we're lucky enough, uh, a binary system, you can have independent way to determine uh, the observed star, the mass of it, okay? Then if they're agree with each other, then there's no problem. But if your, your binary way infer a much larger mass, then it's very suspicious that star involving a stronger magnetic field. Okay, okay. So uh, I'll just uh, elaborate a few words. Okay, uh, basically we know like neutron stars uh, strongly magnetized. And we also talk about uh, magnetars also strongly magnetized 10 to the 14 to the 15 Gaussians. Okay, uh, we wonder about their origin, okay. Uh, of course, uh, you may wonder the origin of the magnetized uh, massive stars, but if, if you think, if you suppose so, then when they collapse to form uh, very strong compact objects such as neutron stars would not be very surprising, okay? So maybe I'll, I'll leave time for more questions at this point. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a few. Uh, I think the, the, the major one is the following. Major one is, uh, I know your idea is that the reason black hole can exist in that forbidden zone is because of the magnetic field. But previously you said um, the reason that that zone is forbidden is because of pair instability. Uh, namely, the photon in a very high density core of the star can produce electron position pair. And somehow that just uh, dump the uh, radiation pressure and therefore uh, make the uh, star unstable. So I wonder how does the magnetic field can come to solve this problem? 
Uh, I pro you probably mentioned that, but uh, but I may pass uh, very fast, and I didn't catch up. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll further answer this question. Uh, basically, uh, normally when people talk about star without magnetic field, they you probably just have the gas and radiation pressure. Okay. So uh, when people do the supernova model for massive stars, uh, basically the basic idea is using this. Okay. So then if you're sufficiently massive. Uh, the central temperature is high, density is high, then you can have the induced pair instability, the positron electron one. And that uh, induce the collapse and the pulsation and eventually follow their numerical simulation, you don't have a black hole left behind in that uh, range, okay? That's the numeric, like uh, uh, Stan Woosley people, it out, okay? So now when we have magnetic field uh, reasonably strong within the star, so then the balance would involve the gas pressure, magnetic force, and the radiation pressure, okay? So in a sense, you, because of the participation of the magnetic field, you don't have a, that high temperature, that high density for the same massive star, okay? Is that clear? Because of the participation- Yeah, yeah, okay, I, I get your idea, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so for that, Previously, you have a massive star, you will have a higher temperature at the center. Now for the same mass, if you have a, a magnetic field involved, the central temperature would be lower. The density would be also lower, okay? So then uh, when you evolve in that, uh, in that stage, you don't have the pair instability, but if you have the position uh, unstable, uh, the dynamic collapse, you can still form the black hole. So that's the basic idea. I see, I see. Uh, just an additional question. Then how, how, uh, how strong the magnetic field must be to support this scenario? Let's see, I should have. Uh, 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 typically, uh, maybe 20 or 30% of the gravitational energy, potential energy. So if you are say okay. mag total magnetic energy is less than say a few percent of the gravitational potential energy, then you consider that's a weak magnetic field limit. Okay, and then that star uh, would not deviate that much from the uh, star without magnetic field. But if you reach the level of the magnetic and total magnetic energy over the gravitational potential energy, like 20 to 30, you, in principle, you can even stronger, but I'm saying if you are 20 to 30%, okay, then it will be sufficient to lower the central uh, temperature uh, in that, uh, to avoid this uh, pair instability. I see. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So they've written if such a massive star exists in a binary system, it would be easily distinguished, right? So have uh, such in a massive sense, stars we have being a conventional way. Uh, we have a conventional way to detect to infer the mass, but if independently uh, the star somehow also in a binary system, uh, if uh, everything lucky, uh, we can in principle infer its mass independently. Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, if I've understood your argument correctly, the um, including magnetic fields in the stellar models uh, allows you to create black holes in the um, um, that evade the the pair instability. Uh, now, avoid the pair instability. Yes. Um, if um, so, the no hair theorem. No hair theorem is explicitly forbid black holes from having magnetic fields. So whenever stars that are magnetized form, form black holes, the magnetic fields have to be expelled somehow. Do you have to explicitly take this into account uh, in this um, model? Uh, at this moment, I uh, didn't uh, uh, sort of uh, consider this problem. Uh, I don't know whether I have the notion right. Uh, of course, uh, people uh, don't talk, uh, well, in principle, uh, black hole have a mass and also in principle could have charge uh, theoretically, okay? So if a rotating with a, is a charged black hole with rotation, in principle that could uh, involve a magnetic field. But right now I'm, uh, at this moment, my model is purely sparkly symmetric. So uh, also astrophysically people think uh, you don't have a sort of a charged black hole, okay? So in a sense, I'm thinking everything collapsed, ma uh, matter and magnetic field into the black hole. 
they somehow disappeared, but I don't know whether that notion is correct or not. Just squeeze everything into. It. In a sense, we have the matter fall into the black hole. You don't know, at least I don't know what happened. So if the matter drags a magnetic field into the black hole, uh, so it's, a, it's a kind of an energy form or matter form. I don't know uh, whether you agree, agree on that or not. I am just arguing uh, for that. Yes, I think that's right. Um, basically, I think it all has to be completely expelled or completely absorbed. It doesn't, uh, you don't but see yeah, 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 completely, direct evidence of it. I'm thinking about complete, uh, completely absorbed. Yeah. Okay. No, it's an interesting question. But uh, um, yeah, no, thanks, for, uh, thanks for an interesting idea. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ching, once more. Thanks for a great talk. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. 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 Great to see you, and uh, yeah, see you next time. See you next time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. See you next week. <laughs>